Welcome back to Profiles in Caring as we continue our story now in Costa Rica and a study of the capuchin monkeys living inside a dry rainforest. Here again, Doug Jardine. Lomas Barbudal, a dry rainforest. Six months of the year, this area will look no different than a tropical rainforest, but when the winds shift and instead of blowing from the Atlantic, begin to blow from the Pacific, this area goes dry. Researchers come here throughout the year to study capuchin white-faced monkeys, and as the dry season takes hold, that research becomes easier because the canopy of trees slowly retreats, revealing the movements of the capuchins. And it seems there are always new behaviors, and the latest is one introduced from another capuchin monkey group. The monkeys at this site and at a few other select sites in Costa Rica engage in some really interesting behaviors. Um, They've been referred to as hand sniffing uh, or vulnerable contact behavior. Uh, it's, this seems to be a social tradition of some really curious interactions between pairs of individuals. They kind of develop a repertoire of interactions within each set, but they kind of learn it from somebody else. So they will do things like get very close together while they're grooming and stick um, fingers in each other's eyes or up their noses, down their throats, um, things that look really uncomfortable and unpleasant, uh, but they seem to be quite relaxed while they're doing this. And they saw that one monkey came into the group, brought the behavior, started doing it with others, and then those ones started doing it with others too, so you could see this pattern of transmission. So there you have something that's really interesting in that um, it's bordering on what we like to call culture in humans. Um, but to be safe, when we're talking about animals, we call it a social tradition. It's something that uh, doesn't last over time. It's not essential to existence, but it kind of comes and goes in a trend, and it's in taught between individuals. They're learning something about their relationship with each other. So if you imagine when you go up and you hug somebody, you feel the way they respond to that hug. You know, they hold you close, they hold you back. Maybe they don't hug you at all. They just move away and give you the cold shoulder. You learn from that how they feel. You know, maybe they don't like you, maybe they like you, maybe they like you a little too much, more than you like them. Um, and the idea is that by engaging somebody in an interaction that might be slightly aversive or slightly painful, slightly scary, if that individual engages you back, cooperates in this activity, then that relationship with you is important to them. And um, so by sticking your fingers in somebody else's eyes, for instance, or taking someone else's fingers and sticking them in your eyes, in a sense you're communicating, you know, our relationship is good. And they have very, very little time to actually, the, the, the special time of like socialize. They do that obviously as well, but it's kind of limited because the, the, the feeding pressure is a lot, it's, it's very strong. Um, especially then in the dry season, you can see everything is getting really, really dry. We're losing all the canopy and the pressure for finding water is extremely high. And so that obviously limits all the, also the range where they can go. And then apart from that, the competition between groups is very high. The other groups might want to utilize the same resources. And so that's another pressure that they face of like not just having to feed not ha just having to, to allocate time to stabilize and to, to care for their relationships with each other, but then also to protect their territory. Several years after this research project began, the Capuchins continue to offer new behaviors and to produce new questions. The whole um, soap opera, as we call it, with the monkeys, as soon as you, you learn about the monkeys, as soon as you know them really well and you study them almost every day, um, you just know their personalities, they're very, very strong personalities in, in, in every group. And, and everybody has a, has a social relationship to each other, and so you get caught up into this whole, in their life. And it's like, this monkey doesn't get on with that monkey, and today my knee has a trouble with Diablita. And, and the next day maybe they make up, so you want to, you want to see these things. And, and there's a development throughout the whole time, and things change and th things development just as, just as much as humans and human relationships develop and change and, and so once you get caught up in that it's very hard to leave. <laughs> the locals don't have the time nor resources to study the capuchins and these researchers here today will tell you they need more money too 
But it's not only the study of the animals, but how they and us and everything and everybody else fits into our own global habitats. Without following the capuchins in nature for an extended period of time, it is not possible to pick up on their personalities or to understand the nature of their social relationships one with another. Or, these researchers will tell you, it is not possible to see what they call their striking similarities to humans. By better understanding the capuchin and lending that field intelligence to the local Costa Rican population, they can then, with much more accuracy, determine the monkey's fate by determining how this dry forest land will be used and what laws in the future could be enforced. There are studies that show that things like massage and touch in general can influence the body in a neuroendocrinological fashion and it can reduce stress levels if the touch occurs in the right context, in the right you know, form. One way I have of looking at both of those questions is by collecting fecal samples to look at stress hormones. I look at um, glucocorticoid hormones. Uh, and so I can actually know how individuals are coping with the stressors they experience and how um, engaging in these behaviors actually affects their stress levels. Fecal samples are really useful in the field because we can know about the health of the individuals we're studying without having to affect them in any way. They mostly think we're a little strange when we go pick up their fecal samples, but other than that, um, it's totally non-invasive, uh, which is just a great opportunity to really transform field research into something more than just observation, that we can actually go in there and make connections between the behavior and the biology and you know, understand health and reproduction, which have tremendous consequences for conservation efforts. By doing these all-day follows and collecting multiple samples throughout the day, I can actually see responses to specific events. So after this intergroup conflict, um, the alpha female Diablita was you know, charging out there. She was really putting herself on the line against these other males. Um, it may be that about six hours from that event, about noon today, the fecal sample, or when she defecates, that sample will reflect a much higher level of stress hormone that I'll actually be able to track throughout the day. And um, so for me, this has great uh, implications because I can look at, you know, specifically how do they respond to events and how that's influenced by what they do afterwards. But it also has really great implications for conservation work in general because we can understand what it is that stresses out individuals. Colleen will go back and wait for those fecal droppings so that she can study the capuchin stress levels from this morning's group encounter. I'm not going to join her on that search. But when we come back, a little soapbox standing as these researchers voice opinions on monkeys as pets and the continuing problem here with poaching.